Dr. Yuri Tiding. Um, Yuri is another one of Lex's former PhD students. Um, Yuri is now an assistant professor in the philosophy department at this university and also a principal investigator um, for one work package of the SOPS4RI standard operating procedures for research integrity project at the ethics, law and humanities department of the Amsterdam University Medical Center. And I should say he's also a clinical psychiatrist. Yes. Um, and in that context, I should mention that he has written a book entitled Scholar on the Sofa, How to Survive Academia. So if anyone, if anyone wants to book an appointment with Yuri, uh, you can approach him during the break, I think. <laughs> but Yuri's work is on research integrity, mental health in academia, research culture, publication pressure, open science, the validity of clinical trials and assessment of research and researchers. So Yuri, uh, it is our pleasure to welcome you here. One quick question before you begin. Yeah. So you've worked with Lex for quite a number of years now. On average, how many emails do you exchange with Lex over the Christmas break? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, that's a good question. It started because uh, Lex uh, told me once that he was he was he did not get any emails on Christmas, uh, and he started to worry that his inbox or that his email was not working anymore. So <laughs> then I decided I need to soothe him a little bit, and I start sending him emails every Christmas, the first uh, Christmas day, to that he knows that his email is still working. <laughs> <laughs> Yuri, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, by the way, just a, a declaring interest, I'm not the psychiatrist of Lex. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, so uh, as, uh, as uh, I'm Yuri Teiling, um, I'm going to talk about funders and the responsibility of funders. You see the colors, and that's something that I uh, I, I, I got from Lex as well. He he read somewhere uh, that if you use different colors in your presentation, then it attracts its attention and that people uh, consume more of the information that you give. So that's why the colors in the presentation, and I just put some random colors there <laughs> on random words but just for the, for the sake of it. So, um, um, another declaration is that I'm not a funder myself, so that, uh, uh, that's also important to know. And uh, um, I start with the uh, psychology of funding, because as researchers, we have a love-hate relationship with, uh, with funders. Because, um, well, we really want their money. And they're not giving us all the time the money. So, so sometimes we really love them and sometimes we hate them. Um, so that creates a sort of dependency. And if I look at myself and look at the symptoms that I have, uh, then uh, I, I, see, cr I see myself craving for money, that there is a certain tolerance, that I need to have more of it, and I want to have it more and bigger amounts, uh, that I have withdrawal symptoms if they reject me, that I s do not sleep well, that I worry if I don't have the money. So I was thinking, as a psychiatrist, well, what is it exactly? And I think that I'm addicted. To funders, and I think a lot of you as well are addicted to funders, um, and I think that's a problem um, because uh, if you are addicted, then it, it is you really want to know why they make the decisions that they make about your applications, um, and that creates if if if, if that creates uh, one the dependency, secondly a certain distrust because we really want to have the money and we don't know why we don't get the money. And it also creates a weird disinhibition because if, even if they reject us for 90% of the cases, um, we still want their money uh, and we still come back to them. So this is an interesting relationship. And I think we should also work on the relationship we have researchers with funders. And I think a more healthy, more responsible, and a more harmonious relationship would certainly help. So then you think if we are the addicts, uh, and I say I, but I also say I see a lot of addicts there. Um, if we are the addicts, the funders, what are the funders then? Who are those people? Um, then you think they are some sort of uh, drug dealer or uh, they behave bad. Um, but if you look at them, there they go. 
they're super friendly, nice, positive, optimistic people. They really want to help you. They really want to do that you that you get the money or that you that you do wonderful research. Of course, they can be opinionated sometimes, but they are great people. So how come it, how come that we are the addicts on people that are so nice and so friendly? Um, uh, and I think uh, one of the problems there is that uh, if we have these applications, uh, that we put in these applications, that we have to wait for uh, months and then we get this decision. And we don't know what happens in this black box. And I think that this is a big problem. So uh, we uh, are happy to help. And we, I, I, when I say we, we are the sops for i uh, consortium, which is a European project uh, that tries to create a toolbox full of tools and guidance for um, uh, for um, um, for research for research institutes, uh, research performing institutes, and research funding in organizations, in order to uh, help them in guiding them towards research integrity. We're not going to talk about the RPOs or the research performing organizations. Uh, maybe we, we 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 dive into this in an, uh, in another talk, but we really want to focus on the. Um, uh, the, the, the toolbox for funders, because there are six ways how we can foster uh, uh, research integrity uh, in funders. So it's not just a, uh, uh, it's a four-year project, so we did a lot of research and I'm also happy to see and also thankful and grateful for all the great collaborators that we have collaborated with. Um, uh, we did reviews, we did Delphi, uh, Delphi studies, focus groups, surveys, um, co-creation workshops, and it resulted in crispy new guidelines for funders and for research performing institutes uh, uh, that, that can be helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought it would be nice, just uh, because it, 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 this, it Lex really told us. Uh, well, it's, it should not be about me. This uh, this symposium. So I thought, well, I just give some small hinges when he is um, um, when it, that he is he also contributed to the papers. So, and we did a pilot test. So what are these six core topics for funders to promote research integrity? So first of all, we divided it into two different uh, types. First it is the external expectations that we have from researchers, that's the first one, and from uh, research institutes, that they are, f are if, we, if funders should fund certain applications, that the research integrity standards are in place in their institutions. For example, about responsible supervision or about research integrity training, and that researchers comply to the highest uh, ethical and research integrity standards. But also, the funders need internal procedures, and then it's really about f fostering research integrity. Uh, it's on how you select proposals, how you monitor funded uh, projects, research projects, how you cope with within the funding institute uh, for uh, with declaration of interest and how you deal with breaches of research integrity and I would really like to invite you to visit uh, uh, our uh, subsorai website there is the toolbox there are plenty of tools in this this uh, this toolbox already and um, uh, um, it is great to to share this with with funders as well so they can tailor their own research integrity promotion plan uh, according to their own needs. But still, then we have this toolbox, but there are still some uh, problems. Um, uh, one of them is how will, will funders actually implement these guidelines? Will they use this research integrity promotion plan? And who will care in funding agencies about uh, research integrity? Because, I mean, they have these us, and this is us, these obeying clients that are willing to do everything in order to get the re to, uh, to get the funds. So who will actually care in funding agencies about research integrity? And does the lack of transparency create flawed decisions uh, in procedures? Um, and then we also have to think, because we know how to incentivize researchers, how can we incentivize these funders in order to comply to the highest ethical and research integrity standards? So, of course, I thought of some solutions as well. So, first of all is 
use the toolbox and we have a beautiful and, and uh, 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 beautiful uh, implementation plan ready that's easy to use that's practical and that funders can start right away in creating their own research integrity uh, promotion plan second of all is that we have to use the addiction for the better so if you ask a researcher uh, to jump uh, for money, they just ask how high. I mean, this is this is the actual stats because the the the, the, the rates are so low in getting the f the funds. The 10 to 15 percent is actually currently the low uh, 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 rate of actually getting grants in 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 the Netherlands. Um, and we should also think of incentive structures for research integrity uh, uh, for the funders and for the government, so that governments give actually uh, money to the funders only if they actually comply to the highest ethical and research integrity standards. Um, and it's also about to think that we have to think about more transparency uh, uh, and that we have to learn from journals, for example, uh, that we, if we work, for example, with open ap application, and this sounds uh, like a very uh, a radical idea maybe for some funders, but I think if you are open about all the steps in the process of, uh, of, of applications, about openness, about reviewers, openness uh, about committees, openness about the potential conflict of interest of both applicants and uh, committee members, uh, and, and put it open everywhere, including the applications, I think we can do a lot uh, in order to make this black box that we talked about um, a, a transparent box and also start and this is also a dear topic of Lex so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to mention it that we start with the implementation of partial lottery it's so much fairer to uh, uh, to applications there are so many good applications in funding agencies and we can do so much more in order to make that a fairer more diverse uh, and more responsible process so Indeed, we need a transparency box, and um, it's time to follow suit for funders. Uh, so that's why we, uh, I, I just have a small video. I hope it's going to work. Yeah. Um. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And so this is actually what we should do as funders. We should uh, be the, the, the actually the, the early adapters in, in uh, implementing research integrity promotion plans. And then I'm sure the rest of the funders in the world will follow. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm uh, happy to answer some questions. All right. Um, yes, I see two hands up there in the back. Doreen, you, the, yes, go ahead. There's your mic. And keep the mic close to your mouth because that... Will do, will do. Uh, first question I have in the room, uh, how many of you are funders? Can I have some fingers? One, two, three? Okay, so you're going to have a very big job in the following. Uh, so the question here really, uh, thank you for the hyperbole here with the addiction and dealership. And I think in a way, once researchers have had their hit, Usually the dealer doesn't 
do that much anymore. And of course, I'm probably insulting some very good funders here in the room, but what I hear often from research is that like, they gave me the money and never ask a second question. Um, what you're asking, actually asking them is to keep track of what's happening. Maybe do a midterm review where it's not just about the positive things, but the negative things as well, what can be improved. But then we get to this other question. Yeah, that's because then you need more support staff and more people looking over the shoulders of researchers. So I see you nodding. You're probably agreeing with that maybe you need a little bit more feedback loops here, but do you think it's feasible? Well, I think we, we can learn a lot from, uh, from actually from researchers because if we, if we have pre-registration, for example, we also check whether they report the primary outcomes, the secondary outcomes, how they actually, what are the research questions, the hypothesis, for example. And I think it's the same for proposals. It is really weird that we, that we get three million dollar, uh, euros or one million or 750,000 euros and then uh, that there is not a, uh, that you should not make, uh, make clear how, what actually came out of the, of the research and that you stick to the highest uh, research integrity standards. And that's something, yeah, you, maybe you need, yeah, I think you need more support staff, but there should also be a, research, a, a, a demand to researchers that they really have to comply to these rules. And I think it's not so much about support staff, it's really about demanding it to researchers. Hey, you got this, you, you, got, you got a couple of million, now you have to show what you did with it and, and, and that you actually did everything in order to, 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 in order to foster a responsible research. Thanks, yeah. Uh, thank you for the great uh, presentation. My name is Thomas Hoogboom from the Radboud University Med Medical Center. Keep the mic closer. Um, yeah, I'll keep it closer. <laughs> um, so you're saying I'm an addict, which I can understand, but I also feel like a victim. So I was thinking maybe there should also be some support um, care for when I uh, don't get my grants. Um, <laughs> Is, is this uh, something we could also view like a funder as being a uh, Holland casino in the Netherlands, uh, where at some point you have to say like, oh, you're really an addict, uh, and maybe you shouldn't come around here uh, this often anymore. <laughs> is, is that a role for a funder, or is that something up to the <laughs> addicted person? <laughs> How, how do you feel about that? Well, that it is. Then we talk about the Matthews effect, of course. That the, the, the that that people get money and more money and money and more money. So um, it's it's quite hard because it's 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 divided. Uh, you have to uh, you see it more nuanced because if those are research integrity champions. I think they should, should stay addicted. I mean, because <laughs> they do wonderful work. They re really are trying to have the most responsible research, and I think you should reward it and, and keep them addicted. While you, while it is not always the case in these in these Matthew effect people that they are the, high, the that that they are actually working to the high, these highest standards. So it's a little bit in between. You really want to have some addicts around and keep <laughs> coming, but for some addicts it's better that they really go to these detoxification clinics. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. The final question. Yeah, with the um, chances that I am being accused of being in a Stockholm syndrome, I would like to say something in favor of some funders. Um, I'm an addict. My name is Bob Siegerink, and I'm an addict. <laughs> uh, but some funders actually... Um, yeah, that, that's um, thank you, Bob. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but, 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 but some funders actually try, try to do what Sico perhaps uh, said, and as an experience, I can tell you that the Wellcome Trust from the UK actually knocked on our door when I worked in Berlin, and I said, listen, we see that you do a lot of translational research. What do you want to do? Imagine that you would just get two million euros. What do you want to do to improve the way you do research in terms of um, translational research? What hurdles do you want to uh, make disappear? And I said, well, yeah. Um, yeah, not just research, just in your organization, what do you, where do you need manpower? That's called now the 
BM, well, the Wellcome Trust Translational Partnership, and in the Translational Partnership, they visit us. They come to us. Well, I'm not there anymore, but they came to Berlin, and they come there, and they explain, and this is the plan, this is what we're going to do. And um, I think it was just renewed for another year. So um, this works. This is an experiment by the Wellcome Trust. So as long as the um, funders also dare to experiment and do research on this, I think we will head in the right direction. So much for my contribution. Well, thank you, Bob. Just to, to be a brief comment, I, th I really think we need a more healthy relationship with funders indeed. So, And that starts, for example, with that there is less dependency and that you really are, want to learn from each other instead of that it's, it's a, it's a one-way street. So I really like uh, this, uh, this, um, this initiative and I hope it will, be, it will have a, a more, that there is more to follow. Right. Um, thanks a lot, Yuri. So I gather that you will be sending the head of the Dutch Research Council an email, so inviting Marcel Levy to start dancing. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Yuri. <clears throat>